Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, it's, uh, it's been a little bit of an odd week. Like I, I talked about in last week's intro, after getting the latest six-month good news from my, my oncologist, I was left with a little bit of a, uh, so now what vibe. But, um, but I got back into the swing of things. I, uh, on Sunday morning, something happened. I, I decided to drive over to Ringwood Manor, and I wandered around, and I made some drawings. And some of those came out better than, than I expected. Others were a complete disaster, but, you know, I learned from those, too. Um, but it was it was a nice way to spend 90 minutes or so on a, a quiet morning, just walking the grounds and going over to the, the cemetery and, and graves that are from, like, 1780 onward. And just just taking in the morning light and and the shape and weight of things that I was looking at and, and trying to put them on paper. And when I got home, uh, one of my past guests emailed over a picture. See, I'd, I'd sent her a postcard earlier in the week as part of my postcard a day thing where I randomly send out postcards to <laughs> unsuspecting recipients slash victims. And this one was of a 13th century Chinese, uh, uh, I guess, scroll or wall decoration of uh, pink water lotuses. And um, she tried to make a watercolor of of the lotuses. And um, she wrote, this happened. I kind of like it. And I was, I was just so goddamn thrilled that something I had done had inspired someone else to make art. And, um... And it's an artist whose work I've adored for decades. So the idea that, you know, she made this thing because of something I did, uh, I, it just kind of meant something to me. And all of that is, is beautiful in itself. I mean, it's part of the, the weird joy that I, I have encountered and experienced in recent years in my life and something that the show brings to me and something that I give out in the world. But, what it is also is a perfect seg to the other thing I did this weekend, which is record this week's show. See, my guest is the amazing artist Dave McKean. And Dave was on five years ago during one of my London stopovers uh, on a business trip. But he recently emailed me to get my mailing address because he had, quote, something to send you. I think it's interesting, terrifying, and kind of exciting. I'd be curious to know what you think of it, unquote. Now, the idea that Dave McKean, uh, artist, storyteller, creative force I've grooved on since I was like 17, would be interested in my thoughts on something, is kind of mind-blowing. Um, and the idea that he described whatever it is as terrifying uh, filled me with a, a certain sense of dread. But what it, it turned out to be was an advanced copy of his new limited-run book called Prompt. Conversations with Artificial Intelligence. And when I got it, I started to flip through it and then emailed Dave immediately and said, can we record something this weekend? Because we need to talk. So to put it simply, Prompt is Dave's recent deep exploration into Midjourney, an AI that generates visual images based on text prompts. So apparently, once you give it a, a prompt, you get a selection of four images and you pick one for it to further enhance and, and you can sort of play with what's there and what it's it's showing. And the results are supposed to be pretty mind blowing for mid journey, especially like lighting and texture and things like that are, are a real strong suit for it. And it can work in whatever style you're asking it to do. 
because and Dave will go into it. The AI is not just generating or going through stock photos and handing you something. It's generating all the the visuals new from its, uh, we'll say, understanding of of the words you give it. And I'm using all these qualifiers because I have never touched Mid Journey or Dal E or anything else in this vein. Um, some of my friends play with this stuff. They post images in their social media feeds a lot. But as but as someone who only came to drawing and painting in the last year and a half after turning fifty, I find I have zero interest in having a computer generate images for me. I don't mean it in any sort of Luddite sense, but uh, there's something I've learned in the the intersection of the eye and the hand and the world that, you know, I'm not interested in what a, a, how a computer has, has analyzed and assessed objects and styles and light and everything else. Plus, I figured some real artistic genius was going to explore these tools in ways that would be completely illuminating. So why should I spin my wheels doing it? I've got enough distractions, like like trying to figure out how to draw the, the statue next to the, the parking lot in Ringwood Manor on a Sunday morning. The genius I was waiting for in this case turned out to be Dave. Um, the, again, as an artist, writer, graphic designer, musician, uh, at theater and, and film director... Dave's got quite the handle on, we'll, we'll use capital A, art, but he found himself really disconcerted by the experience of using Midjourney. And he'll relate the story about that at the beginning of the, the conversation, but the point is, after seeing the startling and, and weird visual images made by this AI, he, he really found himself wrestling with, with what it means for art, and especially for artists, to be able to make something, quote unquote, by giving the computer uh, um, a couple of words. And he saw how some of his own assignments could vanish as art directors start plugging terms into mid-journey and getting the visuals they want for a project. But but it all led him to really engage with the AI in a, a series of experiments. And and in the process, he learned more of what it can and can't do, and and I think maybe more crystallized what it means to to make art. And along the way, he he also thought more deeply about what intelligence is and, and what creativity is. And that's a, a, another weird description of what prompt is. This book is a truly singular artist, or a creative force, like I said, wrestling with what it means to make art. And if art just means whatever a computer spits out and fine tunes to our specifications then it raises the question of who really is an artist. So as Dave put it in an email over the weekend after our conversation, quote, the end result, the destination may be there in its multitudes in AI imagery, but the journey is absent and the art is in the journey. The process of doing it, changing it, talking to it, being challenged and frustrated and flowing with it, that's where all the important human stuff is, unquote. So, uh, yeah, the idea that, you know, I spent Sunday morning just struggling with drawing the, the sphinxes outside Ringwood Manor's one of its entrances while doing a better job with a statue and a black-eyed Susan and seeing how my friend tried to, to replicate that 13th century painting of, of lotus flowers. Um, I'm with Dave. The art is in the journey. So that's why Prompt is such an amazing piece of work, and I think an important one. Plus, the book is just uh, mind-blowing to look at. You know, the, the images are coming from the computer, but the curation is coming from the man. And um, Dave knows how to tell a story. So for now, Prompt is only available as a limited edition hardcover from Hourglass and Alan Spiegel Fine Arts, or ASFA. Um, there's a link to order it at Dave's site, which is davemckeen.com, and I'll have that in the show and episode notes for this one. We're going to get to the conversation in a second, but I should add the other project we talk about in this conversation is a, a comic that Dave put out through Dark Horse Books in 2021. It's called Raptor, R-A-P-T-O-R. Um, it's about, if anything, it's about a monster hunter in a feudal era. Uh, his name is, is Sokol. Um 
And there's a parallel story in the 19th century of a man trying to come to terms with his, his wife's death. And, and there are ways in which the threads of those two stories come together and the permeability of time and narrative. Um, well, it, it's, a, it's a soft barrier. We'll put it that way. And because it's a Dave McKean book, it is beyond gorgeous to, to look at. And we're hoping it'll be a springboard to a series of books from Dave about Sokol and other timelines and worlds that he intersects with. So I can't begin to do it justice here. And just head over to Dark Horse or your favorite comic shop and order Raptor from Dave McKean. I'll put a link to that in the show notes, too. Now here's Dave's bio. Dave McKean is an award-winning illustrator, designer, photographer, filmmaker, writer, and musician. I'd list a bunch of his credits, like making all the covers for the Sandman comic book, or his graphic novels like Cages and, and Black Dog, or all of the albums he's designed, or the books he's illustrated, and, and comics he's made with other writers, or the films and the animation, and, and just a million other creative projects. The problem is, every bio Dave has is like 10 to 12 paragraphs long, and um, I've gone on way too long, so let's get to the show. Now, the 2022 Virtual Memories Conversation with Dave McKean. Describe Prompt, where it began for you, what it is. Uh, tell me where what this book is in, in your uh, understanding of it. Um. Well, it's a kind of extended panic attack, really. Um, I, I have some friends, um, who are illustrators who had been posting, uh, AI artwork, um, on fa on their Facebook feeds. And I looked at them and wondered what was going on. And I looked into it. And as soon as I understood what the, the basic, uh, premise is, which is that images are to understand images digitally, they are converted into ones or zeros or simple uh, word descriptions. Um, and some bright spark had decided to see if he could flip that by uh, having a mechanism where you just type in words and the bot would go off and create images based on those words. And from very rough and ready beginnings, it's now massively sophisticated. Um, and it does this by a process of deep learning, which is um, it heads off into the internet of trillions of images, an infinite amount of images. And if you type in the word banana, it um, goes off and looks at bananas, pictures of bananas, until it understands banana. It understands the scale of it, the nature of it, the way light hits it, the color of it, shape of it. Um, so it's not actually when it creates its image, it's not cutting and pasting images of existing bananas. It's creating a new banana. It understands the nature of banana for you. And so if you type in uh, stone banana, it goes off into the world of images and uh, understands the nature of stone, the way light hits it, the color and tone and the texture of it, and then can apply that to the banana. So you get a stone banana. Um, and then you just take that uh, out into, um, you know, any idea. You can type in anything and it will go out and try and um, match an image to that. Um, and it's, yes, and it's panic attack. terrifying and powerful. <laughs> Um, and will only get more and more accurate in it, in the way that it can interpret, um, your, your words. So I felt that, uh, my, uh, that was it really. That's my job done. Um, <laughs> why would anybody bother commissioning me to, um, illustrate a record cover when, for example, frontline assembly basically give me the same brief every time post industrial. Uh, dark, metallic, you know, uh, landscape, things on fire. And, um, I've managed to find, uh, other, other things for them, uh, to, uh, go along with that music, but they could type those words in and get their record cover. Um, the first thing I did with the beta tester of, um, mid journey, which is the main one that my illustrator friends are using, um, was an album cover. For a friend of mine, Matthew Sharp, uh, cellist, and he has a new album out with his band ZRI, and it's called Cellar Sessions. And I only just started thinking about it. I didn't really have much in mind. I had a basic idea of the kind of image I might kind of head towards. 
So I typed in, I think it was 10 words into, into Mid Journey. And out in two minutes later, it created my album cover for me. And it's, I have to say, I think it's really beautiful. And it looks like my work. And it totally freaked me out. Yeah. Um, and I can't, I didn't do anything to it. I can't think, I can't see any way of improving it. I just think it's really lovely. So I'm using it with a huge amount of guilt because I didn't do anything. <laughs> I didn't do anything. Um, and Matthew could have typed those words in or anybody could have typed those words in. Um, the, the, the strange butterfly effect of the internet means that you don't never get the same image twice. If I type the words in again a minute later, I'd have got a different image because um, it's chaos out there. So it's, it's, it's all very, very strange and alarming. And I thought I could either quit or respond. Um, so I, the, the, the day or two after my uh, meltdown uh, of this, um, I thought I really, I just need to do something. I need to, it was absolutely filling my head to a manic degree. And um, I just needed to put that somewhere and do something. So I immediately thought, I make things, so I've got to just make, I usually make books, I've got to make a book, I, I think in comics, so it's got to be that. And in, just immediately thought of three exercises I could try to, to see what it would do, to, to show the power of it, to show the excitement of it, because it is kind of exciting. You, you type in words and part of the part of the glee of it is wondering what, what the hell is it going to do next? Um, and we can, where does this stuff come from? Uh, so there's that. And, and then the, just the ethical worries of it. Um, especially because, you know, lots of people out there are just typing the names of existing artists in to get things done in that style. And as far as that I, Dave McKean feeling, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So with with the um, with the first image that I did, that album cover for Matt Sharp, uh, I did not type it, and I still have never typed in an, uh, another artist's name. I, that was an immediate Rubicon. I didn't want to go past. That seems to be completely unethical, as far as I can see. Um, but I showed it to a friend of mine who happens to be a neighbour who happens to have done a master's degree in artificial intelligence, and um, told her what I'd been doing, and she said, "Well." Um, it's probably, you see, it's probably gone off into the internet and it's found your work and it's, uh, that's why it looks a bit like your work. So I said, no, I did not put my name in. My name was not part of the prompt for this absurdity. And, um, and, and she said, oh, well, it probably knows your IP address. I like, oh, uh, and I mean, that's enough alone to turn you into a paranoid. You know. There are many reasons I have not played with those systems yet, and the the information gathering on their part is is one of those yeah. many reasons. <laughs> so, I mean, I've done enough of this now. I've now made thousands of images in doing this book, um, and I think I can say with some certainty that that's that is not a thing that it knows my IP address because the vast majority look nothing like me at all. I think it yeah. was dumb luck that I happened to put. Uh, some words in to the AI that lean into the kind of work that I do. This uh, atmospheric photographic. Well, that, that's, that's some of my work is definitely along those lines. Um, and it happened to come up with something that could fit into my, my, my quite, I mean, quite broad scope of work. I do lots of different things and some of it's photographic, some of it's digital, some of it's very analog and drawn, some of it's three dimensional and some film you know it's all over the place so it's it it it, it happened to touch on something that uh, looked like me but it really worried me for a while but enough to compel you to make a book in the span of 12 days yeah which i should point out makes me feel even crappier that i haven't put out a second issue of my <laughs> zine in, in two years seeing something like now I, I feel like i really have to just pound out the last couple of pages and start printing this thing mm -hmm. but anyway yeah you 12 days you definitely should uh, but um but i didn't really do it i mean uh, all i did was i thought of uh, my my three exercises uh, were um the first one i happened to have the epic of gilgamesh in my head because i've been talking to um a wonderful writer uh, who 
whose lockdown project was uh, a musical piece based on the Epic of Gilgamesh. And we've been talking about uh, that and a couple of other things. So I've been reading it anyway. And it's the oldest known living story. And it was written in cuneiform on stone tablets, which is this beautiful visual flowing series of swirling marks. So it must have looked completely impenetrable to the people that originally found those tablets. Um, and slowly they've been interpreting it and translating it. And it's still being translated. There's still missing tablets, so there's still holes in the story. Um, I thought all this was extraordinary. And then the, the fifth tablet is this crucial part of the story where um, Gilgamesh goes off to the cedar woods and destroys the woods, and it's, it's, it feels very prescient, um, hubris of man. Um, anyway, so that was all in my head anyway. So I thought it would be interesting to take this story or part of it and feed it two lines at a time into the AI system to turn it back into a totally visual language. Um, and in that process, spanning 4,000 years and anonymous voices from the past talking to anonymous voices in the internet, um, whether something of the narrative would survive that and whether you could intuit what was going on as that process happened. So that was, that was the first one. And my intervention in all of this was I became natural selection. So uh, uh, Mid Journey spits out four low res images for you to start with. So I was the one, I chose the one that I felt best seemed to capture what was in those two lines of text and then up res that. So that was my intervention. That's all I did there. Um, and then, um, the second story, the second piece was, I was interested in how AI sees us as this sort of ghost in the machine. Um, and I thought maybe it would be interesting to just, I get a paper every morning, take a headline from the paper, which is fairly flat prose. It's not very emotive. Um, I could just type that in. And every, every day I just choose one headline and put that in and see what it came up with. And some of those images were just completely bizarre. Some of them I could see what it was getting at. Some of them, it got very close to being almost photojournalism okay. um, at a push. And then uh, a couple of them just really alarmed me because there seemed to be something else going on. There was one headline that the Labour Party in England was now the true party, uh, party of patriotism and uh, the British spirit. And it, it, it created an image on, based around the Union Jack and it pulled the red out of the Union Jack. Red is the colour of the Labour Party. And there were figures wrapped in the sort of red cloth of the central part of the Union Jack. And there's that phrase, wrapping yourself in the flag, if you're being particularly patriotic. Yeah. So it seemed to be telling some sort of strange joke. And <laughs> so that, that one image really upset me that it was doing that. And it may have just been completely, you know, just pulling strange bits of images from one thing or another. And that's my interpretation that's alarming me so much. But it, that one really got under my skin. There were a few of them that just really alarmed me. So I thought that was an interesting experiment. And then the third one, I just felt I needed to do something where I could interact with it more. Um, so uh, I go for a walk every morning. Um, one of my favourite walks is Rye Harbour, which is not far from me. I usually take my camera and take pictures of the birds and walk around. And I usually take a problem with me. I usually take something to think about, um, a bit of narrative or an image that I've got to find for something or a tune I've got to find for a song, Any, you know, a number of things. Um, so I thought I'd take the AI with me. And um, I took a little recording device uh, with me and just wandered around and chatted to myself uh, as if I was talking to it and observed, looked at the birds and looked at things around me. But I took a number of questions with me that I wanted to go through, the ethical side. Um, I'd, at that point, I got a, uh, started to get a sense of 
how the algorithms were working and what it was very good at and what it was not so good at. So I wanted to talk about that. And along the way, I just thought of questions to ask it that I then, when I got home, typed into Mid Journey and created images for those. So the final piece is a mix of AI images and my photographs of my walk. But I fed everything through another AI system, which looks at my painting. I gave it a painting of mine to look at. And it samples the style of that painting and applies it to all the images. So then what you get is a sort of blend. You get a, 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 point, a midpoint where the reality that I'm photographing and the unreality that the AI is creating sort of mix in the middle. And that mirrored the way I was feeling. That's, that's, I was looking around at re the real world and it was colored by these AI images and I felt I was in this sort of strange other place. So that's what it reminded me in, in parts of the, that, that third section of uh, Malik's Tree of Life. Yeah, very much. In, in, in certain, well, in, in that indefinable or ineffable Malik manner, I guess. But yeah, the, yeah. the sense of your conversation with that universe and the larger world, I guess, was, was uh, I found absolutely riveting. Um, and, and again, to me, the most compelling of the, the three, but because it's the most introspective and the one that's most trying to make sense of something that, well, uh, if my question is going to be ultimately, what did you learn? But there is that, that sense of if there is an intelligence, it isn't necessarily our intelligence. So how are we going to understand slash communicate, I guess? Mm. What did you learn? Oh, well, we'll leave it with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, first of all, I just wanted to say that the first two pieces were very much about just process and watching what would happen. They were, yeah. they were never going to be sort of coherent stories. Although, um, you know, I've shown the Gilgamesh uh, piece to my wife. I showed, it was the first person I saw, who I showed it mm -hmm. to, who has never read Gilgamesh, didn't know uh, what it was about, and um, was just, you know, faced with all of these uh, stone-looking images. And it is quite bewildering to start with. It's hard to know uh, where to get a grip. Um, so I really just asked her to just talk, just look at it and and um, say what you see, as it were. Um, and as she talked through it, locations started to be consistent from one place to another. There seemed to be a couple of characters, and that's true. There are two characters, Enkidu and Gilgamesh at the centre of it. Um, there is a forest. And, and then a number of things she just intuited that we're very, very close to what the actual narrative was. So it is there. Um, and then I think anybody who has a, an idea of what goes on in the story will be able to say, ah, oh, that must be that bit, that, that must refer to that. Yes. So it is there, but it's much more about just standing back, setting up the dominoes, setting up the, the experiment, and, um, and just seeing what would happen, and then, and then observing that. And then using everything I learned from those first two, and the second one's a bit like that as well, using everything I learned from those first two as my questions really for the third part to try and make sense of it all. And in terms of what I learned, a whole raft of things really. I, I learned uh, just in the doing of it where its strengths are. It's very good at complexity, as you'd expect. It's very good at um, surprising you because of the sheer quantity of, data that it's uh, sifting through. Um, whether that is creativity or, or inspiration, I don't think it is. And I read a, a book called The Artist in the Machine, which is an interesting overview of AI and various projects that have been going on uh, to create uh, AI writing and poetry and film and music and all of these things. Um, and th the jury is definitely split as to whether you could genu genuinely say it's creativity or not. And largely that's about how you define creativity. Um, I, um, I learned something about uh, myself of my own sort of expectations of what I do and um, 
my place in all of this. Um, I mean, just a whole raft of things, really. Can you can you expand on that? It, 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 and it'll sound completely mechanical and banal, but it reminds me of things in my day job with the, the pharmaceutical manufacturing stuff where the quote unquote lower value manufacturing has moved to, to other regions where they can just do this stuff where the high value inventive things were were kept home or kept local. Mm. It's only occurring to me now as you say this, but I wonder, you know, are you seeing, is it raising the bar or changing how you see what different types of your, your art which things you can do and which things, you know, are becoming obsolete. Well, the, if the, the job of the, are you totally screwed or just partly screwed is, is, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's hard not to reach that conclusion. Um, I mean, the job of the artist ha has a, is valued because it has a scarcity to it. Um, there's only a certain amount of people who can, um, draw, uh, or play the saxophone or, you know, any of these, uh, creative areas. You're not born with the, with that, uh, skill. You're born with a, a sort of random bunch of qualities that align to make it easier for, for you to do those things. Nobody's born with the ability to play a saxophone. You're born with certain things that allow you, uh, uh, to be able to make good headway in doing that. And then because you're encouraged by the, the fact that you can do it a bit, you practice and you get much better. Um, but if everybody can just think uh, of the sound of saxophone in their head and it happens, well, instantly, all sax players are at work, aren't they? I mean, it's just, it, it renders the whole job meaningless because everybody can do everything. So that's what was going on in my mind all the time. This now means if all you need to do, the, 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 the gap between the lack of effort going in I mean, absolutely nothing going in, really. The ability to type a couple of words. Um, and the hugely sophisticated results coming out, the, the gap between those two has never been wider. Um, and it really is a case that anybody, anybody can, can create anything. And we're only heading towards more and more sophisticated ways of allowing that to happen. And it gets me into the, and this will get into the religio aspect of it too, but it's that difference between create and generate. You know, they're, they're generating images. Are they creating? Well, the question is, will we really notice the difference? Yeah. Um, if you think of mid-journey as simply, um, if you imagine two slide projectors loaded with a thousand slides each, and they're just throwing slides up against the wall and you get two images next to each other. If you get two images that make you think of a third thing, um, I, I can't think of something immediately, uh, two images that immediately go bang in your head and you think you see a different thing or it makes you laugh. Well, that's you doing that. It's not the slide projectors doing that. They didn't know what images were going to come up. They're just randomly putting up images. So the creativity, the art, is entirely happening in your head, the human head. Uh, there's no intent in AI. It can't tell a joke because it has no idea of what that means. It just puts up images that if you find them funny, you've created that. So that, that whole thing is, is interesting. Um, but, it's, but at the end of the day, if, it, if, it, if the images that it creates are so drawn from so much data they're so complex they're so surprising because of that the difference between that and a, a genuinely creative person sitting down thinking of a, a, a new idea a joke or you know a cartoon or a new idea um i mean the question is simply do will we notice the difference between the two will we intuit the difference between the two will we get a sense that that has a humanness about it and that has an ai-ness about it Right. And then there's whole other questions about um, why would we assume that AI thinks the same way as us? Why would we assume that they think the same things are as uh, are funny that we think are funny? Yeah. Is it is it, are we are we developing a whole community of AIs that just go off and talk to each other and tell jokes to each other in AI language? I mean, it's 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 a real rabbit hole, and uh, if you spend a lot of time thinking about this, it's it's 
it's equally terrifying and, I mean, fantastically engaging and, and interesting. Yeah, you and I were both brought up on science fiction of a certain era. So, yeah, th this has always been, I guess, the the background yeah, in a sense, you know, of what, what, what we assumed things were heading toward. We just didn't realize this would be one of the, the manifestations of it, I guess. No. I mean, the, th the, uh, the, the, the other thing that I really got out of reading that book, um, The Artist in the Machine, it's, a, it's an interesting book because it's a great overview, but it's hugely frustrating because yeah. everybody involved in it defines creativity and art and all of those things that are so important to me in ways that I just don't recognize at all. It's all about okay. process and uh, number crunching. And um, I mean, it starts with a, a very, very alarming and, and um, probably true, but doesn't, doesn't make any less alarming quote. Um, the brain, the human brain is totally domin uh, governed by the rules of physics. It can't break the rules of physics. So therefore, an AI eventually will be able to do anything a human brain can do. Um, there's a certain ter terrifying logic about that. But yeah. the thing that I was thinking about more than anything on my little walk around Rye Harbour was um, from my experience living inside a human brain, I'm living inside it here. My experience of, I know it's a data processing machine, but everybody in that book, The Artist in the Machine, talked about human brain in terms of being just a complex computer. And that's just not my experience. No. I, I save images. I mean, I did talk about this in the book. I save images in my computer and I can, I can save an image and, or a document and look at it again in 20 years' time. And it's identical. It's saved it in ones and zeros and recapitulated it perfectly. It's identical. It's a clone. Whereas there isn't a single thing that I've put in my head that hasn't been affected uh, and affected by the things around it and the experiences after it and the memories before it. And the thing that comes out when I re-remember it in one minute's time, let alone 10 years' time, it's a different thing. It's a completely different thing. It does not deal in information in the same way. It, it has a sort of liquid thinking uh, as opposed to cold silicon ones and zero. Yeah. Um, why I call the show virtual memories, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so I, I think the premise of a lot of those, um, conversations about sentience and uh, linking human brains with machine thinking, it seems to be a false premise to me. It's a, it's something a, that I'd, I'd thought about for years before this B that I've noticed with my Amazon echo unit in particular, um, it often turns into more of our reducing our relationship to the machine or to other aspects of our life to be more mechanical than for the mechanism to be more human. I speak more slowly and clearly to my, my Amazon unit so that it understands what I'm saying in a way that I wouldn't if you and I were just shooting the breeze, mm -hmm. because I know I have to slow things down and enunciate carefully for it to understand that I'm asking it to play starship troopers by yes which is the dumbest thing i can ask you know uh, this great ai to do but i find it funny to, to do every so often um but yeah that in a sense we're reducing ourselves to the machine or the mechanistic in in some ways uh and again this is nothing as you point out in the book these are things that people have talked about before but you know we're, we're seeing this now and, and how it plays out yeah and i and i think again that's only going to get more sophisticated and we won't need to uh, we, we won't need to enunciate so much um, as things get more sophisticated. The other big frustration for me with this whole conversation, um, especially in that book, but generally, is that everybody's obsessed with the how and what questions. How can we do this? And the, the process is involved. And, but nobody asks why questions. Why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. Why are we replacing all of these great jobs? People love writing poetry and uh, making music and uh, drawing things. Why are we trying to replace all of that? Why can't we get AI to do all the doggy jobs that nobody wants to do? I'm sure they are doing that as well. But I, I, it seems every chapter of The Artist in the Machine, I ended shouting at it, why are you doing this? <laughs> uh, you know, delighting in the fact that AI 
poetry bot can create a thousand poems in a minute. Great. This is what, you know, exactly what the world needs. Another thousand crappy poems. Um, and every single example in the book of AI poetry or an AI joke, for God's sake, one of the chapters is about trying to get AI to write jokes. It's absolute rubbish. And yeah. it is absolutely not what AI is good at or shows any inclination of being good at or I just don't understand why we're pursuing that, really. Um, I wonder if it's frustrated engineers who are bad artists themselves who, who want to show that, you know, I, I can make something that can make better art than I was able to make when I was nine years old. So. Well, look, I'm really glad you said that because I was left, <laughs> I was, I was left with exactly that feeling. And it, Great minds. <laughs> it feels really mean-spirited to think that. But honestly, <laughs> most, most of the people I could see involved in this the musicians and the composers and the poets and the writers they seemed like pretty mediocre composers and writers who um you know were not going to get anywhere by doing it the conventional way and they found this way of um disrupting the world that they you know they wouldn't really couldn't make a dent in yeah i'm yeah. sure i'm sure that's that is pretty mean-spirited and i'm sure I, I, uncharitable uncharitable <laughs> very good and i'm sure some of them are much better than that i'm sure particularly the music composers um I but um but i was left with that feeling throughout but you mentioned seeing some of the strengths and weaknesses with a mid-journey did you start to see i guess limitations or or i don't want to say repetitions but what did you see as as you know as weaknesses for example within the 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 ai um, I think um, it's very easy to see what the AI can do very well. If you look at the galleries in Midjourney or any AI system that's around at the moment, it, um, it basically puts all uh, fantasy art annuals out of business because they look like just every single fantasy art annual you've ever seen. Um, highly slick uh finished airbrushy um they look like uh, yeah you, you've got a phrase for it gosh at the end of the introduction that cyberpunk yeah uh, yeah, yeah cat oh sorry uh photorealistic manga star wars cat gothic steampunk warrior babes in the style of cg movie production design <laughs> which I thought that's remarkably accurate from what I've seen. So. Yeah, that, that, exactly. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I'm, sh uh, there are, I'm sure there are many other people trying to do other interesting things, but that's the predominant uh, stuff that you see in the, um, in the gallery sections because they are, it's all about uh, style and surface and really none of that stuff, even when it was done by people, uh, had uh, much behind it. Right. You know, it, 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 there, there is not much intent there, but most of that stuff is not about trying to express something really important or profound or moving or um, something that makes the artist angry or, or, or depressed or any of these really powerful human emotions. It's about, you know, ever slicker spaceships and of the Iranians. Uh, it, it's absolutely commercial art. So that stuff is the first thing to be done really easily. And it's very easy to slap on a style of Beksinski is used a lot, um, Salvador Dali, who, who, you know, any of these people. My poor, my, my friend Jim Burns, who was the one of the who was the one of the illustrators I saw on Facebook, gleefully doing lots of mid-journey images is now uh, an absolute standard mid-journey prompt in the style of Jim Burns. He's, he's actively putting himself out of work. Um, so <laughs> that's all very odd to me, all of that side of it. The stuff that you don't see and the stuff that's more difficult is to really direct the bot to do very, very, very specific images so storytelling, for example, is really difficult when from panel to panel, you need to show specific angles, the characters, the same characters doing specific things. So that side of what I do, um, narrative storytelling, seems to be in a safer place at the moment. These people seem to be determined to crack every single uh, problem. So I'm sure they'll get there somehow. But at the moment, that seems to be very, very hard for 
to get out of an AI unit. And then the thing that's really difficult, I think, is drawing. Uh, because drawing is a deeply complex process. And I don't necessarily mean drawing out of your head, the sort of uh, stuff that you get in cartoons or a lot of comic books and imaginative drawing, um, although that, that's also uh, difficult to do. But observational drawing is just is a fiendishly hard complex, if you, uh, complex uh, process. If you're drawing somebody, if you're drawing a person, you're not, not only, you, you, you're trying to get far beyond just what, what they look like, the, the surface information that a photograph could pick up. You're trying to express the angle of the person, the weight of the person, the, the emotions of the person, how they're feeling, how they're, how, uh, are they happy to be there? Do they know that you're drawing them? What's your relationship to that person? What are they thinking? Um, the light is hitting them, but you are also aware of, you know how the light is reacting to the other side of them. So it's not just looking at them from one direction. You're aware of what the shadows are doing. and It's massively complex, um, that interpretive act. So you make a line to try and get the curve of the forehead. And then your next line is a response to that line. It's Maybe it's darker. Maybe it's correcting that a bit. Or maybe it's pulling the brow of the eye forward so it's a darker heavier light you know there's it's a massively ongo it's an ongoing conversational process that is just really hard to to get a, a bot to understand that so it'll create it'll create the look of drawing the slip the, the surface of drawing without any of the understanding which is why most of the drawings almost all the drawings that i've seen a bot do are just rubbish really yeah, as somebody who began drawing 18 months ago, I, I get exactly what you're saying in terms of, of and when, not even with a person, I mean, just looking at trees, which is where I started, that, that trying to understand what's there and the act of seeing, which, you know, to me is, it's what I learned uh, when, when I started doing this, that I was never really seeing things mm -hmm. until I was... I had a pencil in my hand and was trying to figure out how do you get that onto this page and, you know, how is it changing? And, and, you know, luckily for me, I started in winter time when there were no leaves, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, just, just the complexity of the world and the, the attempt at rendering it. It's when I talk about reasons why I haven't played with mid journey, that's one of them. Mm. Uh, just what I've learned from the act of drawing. I'm like, I, I would feel cheap just <laughs> telling a computer to draw something I've, I've, you know, tried to figure out how to do this in my, my amateur way for a little while now. So, sure. I mean, a tree is a monstrously difficult thing to come to grips with the process. Yeah. I wish somebody had told me that beforehand, but. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's wonderful really, because it starts in the complexity of the, the, the development and growth of the tree and the way that the branches form and the, the uh, sort of chaotic um, paths that they take, but they are always paths that are, recognizable if you see the path of a branch we know that we know that path it's like seeing a, a swarm of dots on a screen a computer screen simulating bird flocking you instantly know that that's a flock of birds we, there's something in the pattern that it's hard you know we we, we know immediately um, so we know the shape of trees and we know when it's wrong we, we, we know when people are not really looking at trees they're just drawing something that they think that's how trees go, and it's not right at all. Uh, but then, once you work through that, and you've drawn enough trees, you start to simplify, and you you come down to basic shapes, and trying to capture the the, the, the whole shape of the tree in just a few gestures, uh, and that's a whole other set of problems that again is at the moment I think beyond AI. Yeah, yeah, and it's, I mean, it puts me in mind of the the Wayne White conversation I had a couple of years ago where. His whole thing, the, the way he termed it was the stink, you know, that, that the involvement of the hand and, you know, the, the, that direct interaction is to us pivotal to, to making art art, I guess. But let me ask, you know, the, you know, a lot of the, the work you did, like from the nineties onwards, the, the integration of different technologies, the, the photo collage, use of Photoshop and things like that. Do you see that in any sort of, 
incremental path into this the the world that we're in now with with AI. Not that are you to blame <laughs> for, for where we are, but just that that sense of you know as technology got more and more integrated with the image, that it was a sense inevitable. Um, well, I was an early adopter of Photoshop um, yeah. because I was at the time I was doing a lot of collage work. I like bringing elements together that have had a life already and, and pushing them together and uh, watching them buzz off each other. I, I like that process. I've always liked to collage. Um, I had starting do, started to do experiments in the dark room with um, double and triple and exposures and uh, pushing um, negatives together or, or, or film together to get multiple images. Partly for the fun of it, uh, because it's surprising, uh, and partly because I had images in my head that I just couldn't couldn't really make in any other way. Uh, so I was very happy exploring all of those. And I liked machines that would come and play with me. I like um, I, lo I loved photocopy machines because they have a go. You know, you put something on the surface and move it around or shine lights into it or give it a kick or press all the buttons at once. And it, it doesn't really know what you're trying to do, but it has a go and it spits out some things. Uh, it, uh, so I like that sort of uh, partnership of machines that... Um, that uh, uh, give you room to play. Yeah, exactly. They, 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 they respond. You know, they give me something and I can, then I can respond back. And I like that. Um, so uh, I was obviously interested in computers because they're it's such a powerful tool. I was doing a lot of design work and hating uh, cutting out bits of type typesetting and sticking them on the paste up boards. I, I really, really hated all of that. So the fact that I could do the design work in the computer and most of my peers at the time who were doing album cover design and book covers were swapping to computers. So I had to, I had to dive in. So I read the Photoshop manual from cover to cover. It's the only manual I've ever read. And I, I thought somebody's written this for me. Somebody's written this exactly for me. This is exactly what I want to do. And all of the tools are named in exactly the way I would have named them. Um, this is perfect. So I was an early adopter. And as I was doing it, I realized that there is a whole raft of craft skill here being put out of business. I mean, there's a lot of you know, great darkroom techniques and uh, pre hot, hot metal type and all of these sort of um, artisanal skills that are just being swept to one side at a stroke. And then, of course, you immediately started to see lots of art directors just not bothering to commission photographers and illustrators when they could take a snap or two and buzz it through a couple of filters and overlay it and get a cover for new scientists themselves. So uh, you immediately saw people, you know, lot, a lot less work around. So it definitely had a downside. But to get something out of Photoshop, to get something really good out of Photoshop, you do have to do the work. You do have to have an aesthetic sense. You do have to have ideas to bring to it. Um, and it's a hugely powerful tool that enables you to reach those ideas and, and, and create those images and also play a lot along the way. You can try things out very quickly and save off versions and come back to them. So it's a it, it's a wonderfully enabling tool. I've always found it uh, great to work with, but you have to put the work in. And I've seen lots of people in the in the in the AI conversations that are going on saying, "Oh, it's just another tool, and it's just like Photoshop, or it's a, it's like uh, Auto Tune for singers or something like that." And it really isn't. I mean, you, I've used Auto Tune, and you do actually have to get pretty close to the note. Uh, you do have to actually be able to sing a bit before you can get anything out of Auto Tune. Um, all of these are hugely powerful technical, uh, technological advances that, but they they enable you with your you, the skills that you bring to it to get closer and closer to uh, a final image. But you do yeah. have to put the work in. The difference is, as I said before, you. You don't need to do anything with this. You just have to, you can type in the word banana and it'll go off and create an infinite amount of images for you. So I think, I think this is a quantumly different thing. I don't think it's just another mark on 
the technical advance. I think this do is you, this is a ma a major Rubicon crossed. I think. Do you see potential for? We'll say, quote unquote, being an artist or virtuoso of this type of form? No. Um, okay. I, don't, I don't really, because um, it's doing all the work. Um, That's what I, I wondered. Because, I mean, we see like the idea that there are so, well, the people who play video games are now like global celebrities for people watching them play video games is something that's completely outside my, my reckoning. But I'd, I'd wondered if, if there's a parallel in this this respect that, oh, he's he's the king of mid-journey. He knows how to get X, Y, or Z out of it. Or if you think it's ultimately whatever you come up with, somebody else can just knock in the same set of terms and uh, um, get something close. You know, you may be right. Uh, and as you say that, you, you are right. That there, There's a whole world of activity out there that is meaningless to me. But it obviously means an awful lot to those people that are doing those things. They are new forms of entertainment and engagement that people are, uh, are getting into. And I, it, that's just not part of my world. So I am prejudiced against that, and I freely admit it. Um, okay. But all I can say is from my experience, from my t very limited experience, I've only just started using it, and it is new technology. It will only get more sophisticated. Um, my sense is that... Uh, it is just a random stuff generator and anybody could get anything out of it. Everybody can do anything. It, yeah. it just fl absolutely flattens the field. It, ev everything becomes a sort of, I think I had one phrase in the book, the, the, whatever the median color <laughs> on, the, on the internet is, that's what it becomes, beige. Yeah. It just absolutely brings everything down to a single field. Now, if you think that that's great, if you think that's the ultimate democratization of art, okay, that's fine. That's a point of view. Um, for me, that's almost the opposite of um, everything I value. It, from, from my past, my sense of myself, this is what I was talking about in questioning where I stand now. Everything that... I see as making up my myself, my sense of self is um, is about individual humans having a passion to create something, reaching out to me through their work, and I engage with that, and I get to see the world through their eyes, full of intent, full of the history of them, the emotions of them, uh, and I aspire to do the same in my work. That whole field of endeavor is what I value. And that's what I see uh, utterly changed by this, really. And I think intent intent seems to be at the core of your question of, of what AI is and what it does. I mean, you have a line in the, the, the third part of the book, it's simply to ask, what is art and why do we make it? Hmm. And you mentioned why in uh, the, the Artist and the Machine, but you know, this is a different sort of why in terms of Mid Journey is never going to spontaneously create art. Uh, you know? It depends how you define art. Uh, I'm sorry. Mid Journey is never going to spontaneously create images. You know, it's not going to decide on its own. You know, I feel like drawing a tree today. It's always going to be a service uh, in a sense that responds to what the prompts are. Yes, uh, although I can easily see that it will be an ambition of eager AI creators to allow computers to go off and create for themselves and uh, mm. the process of machine learning where all you do is put in a few simple commands as a as a base as a basis you don't have to load it up stack it up with lots and lots of data you just put a few basic equations in or commands in and then it goes off and teaches itself the the ai that was that taught itself how to play Go is now the sort of ultimate champion Go player. In the yeah. world. It easily outstripped playing humans. Um, and then it beat the previous great Go AI that had been filled with um, the history of human moves. Right. This one was just fed with the basic rules of Go and then it taught itself. 
and developed a different logic and a different rationale than than human beings would do. Yeah, it's it's that I guess the idea even that I'm predicating things on the notion of intent is human prejudice, I I suppose. Yes. It's yeah, we're getting deep ontological issues yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> Which I'm glad your book evokes all that. It's it's hard not to end any every conversation with uh, with heading down the rabbit hole that the, the basic fundamental definitions of things. Well, it's why I loved, and it's it's not a spoiler, but in part three, you you, you open up the whole book in your introduction by mentioning the well the, the novel that inspired Tarkovsky's Stalker mm. flick or movie. Um, but near the end, you you hit on the other Tarkovsky movie and novel by Stanislaw Lem that has really it just haunted me for years and years and years in Solaris. Mm. And the notion that there can be an intelligent, an intelligence, we'll say, that we simply can't understand, mm -hmm. and it doesn't understand us, and you know, any attempts at communication are just, even as we know, between human beings, communication is tough on a good day. But you know, the idea that there is something like these, like that, that potentially sentient uh, Google chatbot, etc. Mm -hmm. They're going to be out there, and we're simply not going to understand, and they might be operating under a very different set of, of we'll say rules than, than we are yes and i think uh the, thinking about solaris was the the clearest way i could explain how i was feeling about the ai it felt very much like a strange even though i knew it was not it felt like a strange alien intelligence um mm -hmm. rifling through my head as i put these uh commands in or these handfuls of words in and coming up with these images without any, um, I mean, the thing about Solaris is it's, uh, the, the idea is it's a, it's a sentient planet and you've got these astronauts in, uh, uh, orbit around it. And it's just reaching out into the minds of the astronauts, looking through memories and coming up with images. And you get a sense it's not malicious. It's not. It's not anything. It's just trying to make contact. Um, uh, but the effect that it has on the <laughs> psychological state of the astronauts is, is catastrophic. Uh, one mm -hmm. of them has recently lost his wife. And so the, the Solaris keeps on bringing his wife back for him. Yeah. And the, I mean, this is playing dreadful mind games. So, and that's how I felt. Uh, this, this AI is just doing this stuff. It doesn't care how I feel about it. Um, but the effect that it's having on my mental health is um, is strange. Um, uh, there was one part, there was one um, moment in doing the second story where one of the headlines I chose was um, the, uh, the the school shooting here school in Texas shooting in America. That's right in Texas. Um, now I, I was choosing the headline to put in. I could have done the whole month's worth of headlines on the war in Ukraine. I could have done the whole month's headlines on the ludicrous uh, fight for the um, leadership of the Conservative Party in England because they're in the they're in the Guardian's headlines every day. But I wanted to move it around a bit. I wanted to have some 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 different uh, stories there. So I choose ones to vary it a little bit. Um, and I, that was such a, uh, an important story. I thought that I, I'd try and get the bot to do that one. And I, that was the only one. Every, every other story I took, I, it, it gives me four possibilities. I just took one of the four, but that was the only one that it gave me four. And I just got it to try it again and again and again. I think I got it to try again five times and I gave up because it obviously the only images in relation to that series of words, that specific story, was it was all about the grief of the people outside. Um, it, it was taking those photographs of um, teachers and students outside, embracing each other and consoling each other, um, and yeah, the buildings and the you know what few cars that were around maybe, but it was just working with that and recapitulating it again and again in ever more distorted forms. And I just thought it was obscene. Um, and there's just no way I could include their grief in my experiment. Yeah. To make what point? 
exactly. Uh, I just couldn't do it. And the bot wasn't trying to upset me. It was just doing, it just spitting out stuff. So no intent there. It felt absolutely like Solaris just trying to make content, uh, contact. Right. So, yeah, just, a, again, a very strange experience. All of that stuff was happening. That was me. I was bringing all that uh, <laughs> emotional turmoil to it. It didn't give a damn. But that's the thing. It, you know, it, it, it has no feelings to hurt. So it's it not really bothered about hurting mine. Right. Oh, so we're going to have an awful lot to think about with this this whole project. Do you feel like finishing it and, and bringing it into print, I would not say catharsis, but, you know, did it, it help you? either crystallize exercise or otherwise process what's uh you know what what the implications are here or at least exercise some of the the turmoil you were going through completely uh that and, the, and the, ultimately this is why i make things you know i i i get angry about things or i get moved by something uh, or obsessed by something i've just got a i'm lucky i've got a job where i can put it somewhere and make yeah. something um so Absolutely, it was about that. It taught me a lot. It was absolutely fascinating to do, and I'm I, and I, I I found it absolutely thrilling to do as well as as well as terrifying. I mean, I was waking up at five in the morning, eyes wide, can't wait to get back to it to see what to see what it's going to do next, and to see where this is going to go. Having spent such an intense twelve days with it, it kind of cured me of the cure curiosity of seeing what it'll do next I'm, okay. I'm not desperate to see what it'll do next anymore you know, to put you in ai rehab or something uh, def yeah definitely <laughs> in AI rehab. Um, so to move to, 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 to slightly less weighty probably more weighty topic though you mentioned uh the the sanity salvage lockdown projects that a few of your friends engaged in uh both yeah. in the introduction and in our, our conversation um what were yours did you have anything to, to save your sanity throughout lockdown? Um, actually, yeah, we, we haven't talked since all of that happened. It's been five years. Five years. Bro. I know. I know. It's Literally, it was episode 250, and this is going to be 497. So wow. it's like, yeah, five years. God damn. It was like only last year. Yeah. Um, uh, well, yeah, it was... Again, how's your pandemic been? Is is the general way I would phrase this, but you know, uh, I I was going to say I again feel very fortunate in my I, where I live. I'm in the middle of nowhere. I live in the country, so um, I could walk every day. Uh, I didn't. I I by dumb luck, I had planned a year off travelling, um, because I'd done an awful lot of travelling the previous two years. And I had a bunch of personal projects and some commissioned things that I really just wanted to get into and, and deal with. So I planned not to travel at all. And then I couldn't. So that, that was okay for me. Um, I could walk every day. Uh, my wife was much uh, more adversely hit than I was. She's a, te a music teacher and mm -hmm. musician. Uh, with folk bands and an orchestra and and string quartets so uh, she's a violinist so overnight like every other like all my other creative friends in those sorts of areas her diary diary was wiped clean she had nothing to do and uh, she was you know beside herself with that and trying to deal with that um so i was in a much better place i had work it was it, it was carrying on the books were still on track um the only things that were cancelled were a couple of exhibitions and they were just postponed so i could just get on with the work i was going to do continue walking every morning and focus on keeping claire's mind off um all the things she couldn't do by making routines here and we completely uh, took the studio apart put it back together again so we're now on on top of our lives where we weren't quite before so we had we tried to make a positive out of it um and my lockdown projects were those personal projects i i had a, a couple of books i was in the midst of and uh, finishing up raptor and um so yeah i i got lucky with that and um actually it's been the the war in ukraine that has affected me much more and uh, in terms of 
depression and yeah. uh, general feeling that uh, I don't know why I'm getting out of bed in the morning. Um, but uh, I, I had a reasonably, guiltily, I had a uh, rather positive year, uh, that first lockdown year. Yeah. Many of my artist and cartoonist pals have generally said, yeah, my life didn't change that much, <laughs> which is mm. probably a condemnation of the, the cartoonist and artist lifestyle. But but yeah, I wasn't sure if you had a yeah. particular things that arose during that that time that really no there is some there's definitely some conclusions to be drawn from the course yeah. of my existence <laughs> uh that, that, that i mean the, but there were other interesting things um i had two exhibitions during uh kind of lockdown where i couldn't travel or wasn't going to travel in um brussels and tenerife and a couple of places that i would have loved to have gone i would have visited normally i would have gone to the openings but because of the nature of the state of the world we found ourselves in the midst of um the exhibitions went on but we could but they could do digital walkthroughs and so i could i could live walk through thanks to somebody there with a camera uh and answer questions from people around the world we had hundreds and hundreds of people check in from all over the world and ask me questions live and there's no way we would have done that um had I gone to the show. So, you know, that is that is the great advantage of some of these technological uh, communication advances. We can uh, we can fill in a lot of those gaps now. Yeah, it's been my trade-off, again, being able to do this remotely instead of you and me sitting down in person like we did in London that time. I'm more comfortable doing it with, uh, doing remote podcasts with repeat guests like you. Mm -hmm. When it's somebody for the very first time, it's a little weird just not sitting at a table across from someone, you know, face to face and, and having that first conversation. But, you know, as as we've demonstrated, uh, we're, we're very adaptable as, as far as, you know, what the environment and constraints put on us, I guess. Yeah. I mean, you get a, you get an awful lot from a, from a conversation outside of what's actually being said, body language and all the stuff that happens before and after it. You it's always the conversation in the hallway. That's that's how I always, on a business sense, that's how I always phrase it. It's the the, the talk before you get into the conference room. That's yeah. where you get the little hints and clues as to where things are going to go. But yeah. but yeah, uh, my my other question. You did mention Raptor. Uh, the, the the first is it Sokol book? Yes. Well, okay, I make sure I'm pronouncing it correctly and not missing an Eastern European pronunciation. Chokoy or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> um, more of them coming. I adored and enjoyed the the first one so i i you know i pine for more comics work from you so anything in the pipeline I, thank you um i i would like to do others and I've, I've i've had a couple of ideas for other stories i would keep the 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 uh the traveler character the shock the the uh, the, the, the uh, strange traveling man with his bird character the um the other story the parallel story um would change and i think i just have different parallel stories and probably in different, in completely different times. I think I'd like to do a futuristic one that dealt with some of these questions that have been coming up with uh, the development of artificial intelligence. Oh, um, and I'd like to do one, you know, in the distant past and uh, pick out interesting places there for him to interact with. Uh, the idea for the character was to have, for him to embody that sense of what, where do ideas come from, I suppose? Uh, you know, that, that sort of thing that you touch that seems to be some other realm where these ideas suddenly appear in your head. And where is that, where is that arrived from? Something of that. And also to have a character who is trapped between states. I'm, I'm very keen on, um, finding, uh, a pathway between arguments. I, I think there's a real problem at the moment with people bunkered down, bunkered into their particular views of the world and not even allowing the, the possibility of seeing through the eyes of somebody who thinks in a different way to you. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to find a character who could explore a way in between worlds, halfway between fantasy and reality, halfway between truth and uh, fiction and fact, uh, halfway between states, halfway between the state of uh, being human and, and being raw animal. I just thought that was an interesting place to be. And um, I, I thought that sort of basic sort of character would allow me to explore lots of different ideas. I adored the first installment. I will foist it off on people to, to try to, you know, 
boost your sales. So Dark Horse calls and says, we need more of this. You know? Wonderful. Thank you. Very much. Uh, it's, also, it's also really influenced by those, um, you know, that great strain of uh, natural history writers we talked about a bit, I think, in the first podcast, Robert McFarlane and his yeah. extended reading list. Um, and Paddy, Paddy, Patrick Lee Firmer and all those guys, Eric Newby. Um, and particularly the political side of it, where um, it's not just walking amongst the landscape and, in, and enjoying and reporting back on it and finding new ways of uh, talking about it, but actually um, realising that part of the political process of greying out land so it can be developed is just to extract all the language from it. It just becomes scrub. It just becomes, you know, indeterminate land, grey gray fill. Yeah. Uh, whereas there are whole ecosystems going on there. There's a whole history of the way different, um, uh, uh, you know, different groups of people who have lived there have talked about those things. And it's bound into the language and the sense of identity of the people who live there. It's layers and layers and layers of human history and also ecology that is just being pushed to one side. And by reclaiming that language and rediscovering those words and using those words and uh, writing uh, stories that evoke the intricacies of that language, I think it tries to push back against that uh, dismal political uh, development. We could go on for another hour talking about that. And I'm going to tell you a bunch of things after we get off the, the show about things I hope you're you're reading and if you're not I'm going to send them links to you uh links right. to you about them but I guess real last question though in that case who are you reading oh, um oh well uh, at the moment I'm reading um uh Horatio Clare I'm reading have you read his books no okay he's a, a British um journalist broadcaster and writer um he's he also is part of that natural history reading list. He wrote a beautiful book about, uh, it's called, I, I can't I never remember the titles. It's about, it's about the, the, the flight of a swallow. And we have swallows here all the time. So it's a very uh, present bird. Um, and he lives in Wales. So he decided to track the swallow from its nesting in South Africa, all the way through the heartland of Africa, up through the Mediterranean, through Europe, across the channel, to the little birds that nest in his barn. Oh, I see. A single swallow is single is the, the book. The, the one upshot of doing these remotely is that I can I can look up stuff on the internet while I'm talking to the guest. But hey, I'll rely on you to do that, so I don't have to tell. Wow. Um, and then he wrote a book about the uh, the narrow billed curlew, I think it's called, which is probably extinct, but there are many people still alive who. Uh, and it makes a cameo in Prompt, as, as I recall. It does indeed. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the book I'm reading at the moment is called Heavy Light. And mm. um, he's, he's had a long battle with mental illness. And he had one huge uh, uh, manic episode, uh, which lasted quite a while and threatened his marriage and family life and his own sanity. And so the first third of the book is seeing the world through the mind of somebody in that state. And he writes so brilliant, lucidly about it, even though he's in this totally altered state of paranoia. And uh, I mean, it's all the stuff that you, if you've ever talked to anybody who, who um, you know, thinks the, about deep state and everything's tracking him and all that kind of stuff, anti-vaxxers, all of those, those, patterns of thought it's absolutely there in that first chapter and it's extraordinary to sort of be inside that brain looking at the world so clearly so that's the first part the second part yeah, it also shows up in raptor with the the apophonia of the the lead character well anyway go go yeah. <laughs> i see i'm tying these threads of your life together dave I, yeah, I see exactly. it's, <laughs> it's all bound together it's all one it's all one neural net um mm -hmm. the second part is just uh he's if he's sectioned he uh, spends a period of time in a mental hospital tr trying to uh, be convinced that he's ill and needs treatment, uh, particularly, obviously, by his 
wife and, uh, and um, friends, close friends. And then the third part is um, coming out the other side of that and doing research into the medical side of it, which often is very mechanistic. And if they can measure it, they, can, they got a pill for it. And really the evidence that um, this, this kind of, uh, these kind of um, sort of traumatic mental states uh, is actually about a chemical imbalance. The evidence is really thin, if there at all. I always thought that that was the case, but that does not seem to be the case. And he, I've just reached the point in the book where he's found one of the main clinicians at Guy, Guy's Hospital, who's sitting down with him, saying, look, I've stopped treating people like that. All of my treatment now begins, how are you? How, how is everything else in your life? Because almost all of these, this m m manic way of thinking about the world is trying to put yourself at the centre of it so you have volition, so that you have control, and you are important at the centre of this grand conspiracy. Um, and actually, it's much closer to related to other problems in your life, the stresses in your life, family life, job worries, money worries, all of those uh, things, just life, just dealing with the complexities of living. And now he tackles everything from those, those, those kinds of angles. Are you getting out enough? Are you getting enough exercise? Are you getting enough fresh air? All of those basic things. And you, as soon as you start to pick away at those, the, ma the mania starts to soften and they start to get a glimpse of how they're actually thinking and they can come out the other side of it. So that's a, that's a great book. That's been a great insight into all sorts of things. And I think that, that book also gets a mention in Prompt because that seemed to have uh, a prescience there as well. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I see your daily walks in a different light. Not that, you know, you're, you're potentially looking at mental health in that way, but, you know, maybe prophylactically, the walk helps the, the you're talking to yourself, whether it's allowed or not, you know? Yeah. Should yeah. Try and not look too mad to the dog walkers who are walking by you, but apart from that, yeah, it's definitely. Yeah. I, I've given up, uh, you know, I, I live in the same town and the same house I grew up in. So yeah, people see me wandering around. It's just that guy who hasn't cut his hair in two and a half years. And, and, you know, he seems sociable, but yeah, you know, he says he's got a podcast. I don't know what to make of him, but <laughs> But Dave, thank you so much for, for coming on again. I I will be maybe in England in November. I'm I'm up in the air about this. I've got a trade show in Frankfurt and I'm considering as I did when we met five years ago, you know, making a, a side trip to, to England afterwards. But if well, I do and you see me wandering on your same path, you know, that'll be the, the crazy guy who hasn't cut his hair in a long time. Please do. I mean you know, you come out to the studio next time we can go for a walk. I would love that. So Dave, thanks so much for coming on. My pleasure. Thank you for asking. And that was Dave McKean. His new book, Made in Only 12 Days, that son of a bitch, is Prompt, Conversations with Artificial Intelligence. It's currently in a limited edition of, I think, 450 from Hourglass slash ASFA, uh, but I'm hoping it gets a, a bigger release from another publisher down the line. His other recent book is Raptor, a so-called graphic novel from Dark Horse Books. I'll have links to those in the show and episode notes for this one. Dave McKean's site is davemckean.com, which is D-A-V-E-M-C-K-E-A-N.com. And it's got links to a lot of his work and, well, some of his longer biographical notes, so you'll learn much more about him. He's also on Twitter as Dave McKean and Instagram as Dave McKean Hourglass. But he doesn't use those platforms too much, which, as we all know, is for the best. Now, you can support the virtual memory show by um, telling other people about it. Just let them know there's this podcast that comes out every week with great conversations with writers, artists, musicians, translators, and all sorts of other creative folks. You can also help it out by telling me what you like and don't like about the show. Tell me who I should record with, uh, what movie or TV show or book or piece of music or, or art exhibition or piece of theater or whatever you think I should turn listeners on to. 
And you can do that by sending me postcards, letters. I love postcards. I, I mentioned it at the top of the show. I send out a postcard every day. Um, and the ones I get back are, they're just a joy. So anyway, you can do those, uh, email, Twitter DM, or by leaving me a message on my Google voice number, which is 973 869 nine six five nine that goes directly to voicemail so you don't have to worry about getting stuck in an awkward conversation with me and it um well messages can only be up to three minutes long so if you're going to go super long call back leave another message uh and if it's okay let me know if i can include your message in an upcoming episode of the show i would never do that without the speaker's permission so let me know and if you want to leave an audio tribute for episode 500 use that number. Uh, I was only opening it up to guests, but if you're a listener and you want to say something about the uh, the show and what it's meant to you, or if you have some goofy reminiscence about it, whatever, 973-869-9659. Now, if you've got money or other resources to spare, don't give it to me. Um, you know, it's nice getting stuff through my Patreon, but really my expenses for the show are minimal. My day job treats me well. I'd really prefer it that you helped out individuals or institutions in need. You can find people through GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, Topato Go, Crowdfunder, uh, and other crowdsourcing platforms. There's, um, or crowdfunding platforms. Um, if you're looking for institutions, you know, or, or foundations or, or the like, you know, I give to my local food bank and the poor people's campaign. I make political contributions in a targeted way. Um, there are other things you can do. Freedom funds, abortion funds, Planned Parenthood, election funds. Um, there are a lot of things you can do to <clears throat> try to help build a better world. So um, I hope you will. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading. Keep making art and keep the conversation going. <laughs>